Uh, today, what I want to do is finish up the idea of mixed strategies. Remember, we had this um, these kind of complicated graphs, but essentially, they were just the PDIP thing, you know? Who are the players? There's two. What, they can, what can they do? Well, you know, they can... The, uh, in this particular game, it was you can throw long or throw short, you can defend long or defend short. But this is just a stylized example. You think of any kind of game, you know, the inland revenue auditing, the taxpayers, the police trying to catch, you know, people with speed cameras, uh, random checks monitoring in, a, in a, an organization. It's like there's sort of a randomization element that's, that uh, there's a strategic element that can go on with randomization. Especially it's important when you can't find a pure strategy, Nash Equilibrium, okay, which is Nash Equilibrium is a bunch of strategies which if everybody follows them, they expect everybody else to keep following them, they're mutually consistent, and everybody's making the best response. Notice that we just whip that through. It's like what we expect to happen, what seems like sensible behavior in these stylized games. Well, when there isn't a Nash Equilibrium, then in pure strategies, we can always find one in, pure stra in mixed strategies. Okay? And these mixed strategies are randomization sort of things. So that um, when you're... Uh, trying to throw long or throw short, uh, trying to defend long or defend short. You don't want to do either one of those. You want to, you want to let the other player know that you're randomizing, <laughs> and you want to keep it unpredictable for them. And at the end of the day, we came up with uh, something that looked like this, this little swastika-looking diagram. Uh, whoops. Um, Let me get rid of that one. We had, we had something like this. And these diagrams on the left, we had two sets of them, which are in the handouts which I gave out. They're basically just a way of describing the payoffs. Okay? It's, the problem is, when you're dealing with games under uncertainty, it's a little more complicated to think about payoffs. It's not just looking at a payoff table or in a little game tree, because you don't exactly know what's going to happen. And so we use this idea of probability weighted averages to sort of get a handle on the payoffs. And one of the easiest ways to think about that without doing any, any calculating probability weighted averages is to draw little straight line graphs. Okay? And uh, it's a matter of kind of interpreting those graphs that is, is the problem. You don't have to worry about doing complicated calculations. Uh, though there is some practice little sessions in the uh, questions in the um, from last previous exams where you do get a little handle on how to do this, okay? And once you get your head around it, you've done it two or three times, it's not too hard. It's just a matter of picking out the right numbers from the table, okay? So at any rate, we, we, we got their payoffs, which we kind of looked over here, and then we did the best response analysis, which we did before, you know, is, okay, you know, given one, the one player does this, what's my best response? You know, and the other player, you know, given the other player does that, what's my best response? We figured those things out, and we put them all together in this, this kind of strategy space where P is the, the probability of throwing short for New Zealand, Q is the probability of throwing short for Australia. So these are the mixed strategies, which are now con these continuous mixed strategies. I mean, we could, we could have drawn a little payoff matrix that had, you know, P of 0, P of 0 0.1, P of 0.2, P of 0.3, and just made a nice little discrete example. But that's all too complicated to do, because really what we want to do is figure out this idea. Is there anything which is sensible to expect when people have this unpredictability? And the answer is yes. This little black dot is, co corresponds to a Nash equilibrium in mixed strategies, so that there's a, a particular value of P, which here looks like about 0.6, and we saw the particular value of Q, which is about 0.7. Okay. And those particular mixed strategies, for each of them, they kept the other guy guessing. Okay. And that's the inherent thing, a strategic insight about the mixed strategy idea, is that when you're using these this unpredictability element, the way you use the unpredictability element isn't just, you know, do this or do that. It's, there's a certain level of unpredictability which you've got to work out from the kinds of payoffs in the matrix. Okay. Again, that's a key thing about uh, strategizing or strategic stuff, prediction rather than just statistics, is you want to look at the incentives of the players. So we look at that payoff matrix and we can work out, okay, what do I need to do to keep you just indifferent. So you're not sure to do one thing or another. What is the other player trying to do to keep me just indifferent? So I'm not sure what to do in the other. And that's the essence of the mixed strategy equilibrium, okay? So you're kind of keeping the guy off guard. Each one of you, you know that each one of you is keeping the guy off guard, but there is a little bit of predictability in that, 0.6 and 0.7 in this particular example. Now, what I want to do is just look quickly at um, the use of mixed strategy reasoning in the simple two-by-two two games that we had. Uh, now, 
I've given you the graph for um, this graph here to work with, not this particular one I have up here at the beginning, okay, on your handout. At least I think that's what I've given you. That one single sheet. Okay, it has PMIX on the bottom. And uh, that's this one here, okay. So down here we've got a uh, PMIX, which is uh, the probably going to Cafe 101 in this in the Battle of Sexes game, in this coordination game, and the QMIX. Um, the associated QMIX graph I didn't give to you, okay, because it's once you once you get the table, you can construct the payoffs, which is what those two graphs are, and we work out the best response. So remember this: these are, these are two by two games were simultaneous games where there was. There's two Nash equilibria in that game, right? Uh, two in, in pure strategies. One is up in this cell where both go to Cafe 101. The other is in this cell where both go to coffee culture. And the problem is, how do you coordinate on one or other of these things? They, you know, there's a, um, they'd rather meet together, and each of them has different preferences. So you could think of, well, it's kind of random what you're going to do. You're, you know, as a red player, you're either going to go to coffee culture or, or to Cafe 101. Uh, as a blue player, you're either going to go to coffee culture or uh, um, Cafe 101, and the Q-mix and the P-mix are the probabilities of doing those two things. Now, what I've done is I've made the Q the probability of the blue player going to Cafe 101, and P the probability of the red player going to Cafe 101. So P and Q relate to the probabilities of going to Cafe 101. You could set the whole thing up and say, what are the probabilities of going to coffee culture, but you know, that's just kind of the inverse of the thing. Either way is fine. So what we do, <coughs> excuse me. What we do is we draw a little graph down here where we put. We're looking at it from the red player's perspective. We put probabilities for the, what the blue player is going to do, running from for Q. So this should be a blue, okay? From zero out to one. And then what we're worried about is, well, what are the um, uh, expected payoffs to the red player? Well, if I'm the red player and I go to Cafe 101 then I'm either going to get a 1 or a 0. Okay? I'll get 1 if it's more likely the blue player is going to go to Cafe 101, and I'll get 0 if it's more likely they're going to go to coffee culture. Okay? So what I'm looking at is payoffs between 1 and 0, and they're going to run along this line up here of going to Cafe 101 like this. So this, these are my expected payoffs as the red player. If I choose to go to Cafe 101, Given that I don't really know what the blue player is going to do, but I could sort of think, well, they could have a low probability of going to Cafe 101. They could have a high probability of going to Cafe 101. As the chances increase of them going to Cafe 101, and I'm going <coughs> to Cafe 101, my expected payoffs increase. <coughs> Excuse me. Don't have any water here. Okay. So uh, that's the... Um, this straight line between 0 and 1 going up here from left to right is the expected payoffs, the probability weighted average of these numbers 1 and 0. With, you know, the blue, red player, I don't know, what, I don't know where they're going to be. I'd like them to be at Cafe 1 if I, know if I go there, I'll get a payoff of 1. But if they go to Coffee Culture, I'm getting a payoff of 0. What, what an expected value, what do I think is going to happen? Well, it's going to move along that line depending on what QMix they play, what, chan what the chances are of them going to Cafe 101. Same for the, the line between 2 and 0. It's going down this way. Why is that? Well, because if I go to coffee culture as the red player, I'm either going to get 0 or I'm going to get 2. I'm either going to get 0 or I'm going to get 2. Okay? So it uh, depends on what probability the other guy, uh, the blue player, is putting on going to Cafe 101. So if I go to coffee culture and they put a pretty high chance on going to Cafe 101, I'm getting a 0. So over here, high probabilities of going to Cafe 101, I put a little dot down in this corner. On the other hand, if it's a high probability they're going to coffee culture, there's a low probability of them going to Cafe 101, that's over in this corner, I'm going to get a 2. So this 2 here corresponds to that 2 there. Let's get this right. This 2 here corresponds to that 2 there. This 0 here corresponds to that 0 there. And then I just draw the line in between, okay? I don't want to do all the calculations. That's too hard. But the calculations are just represented along the line. So now I know these are my expected payoffs if I go to coffee culture. These are my expected payoffs if I go to Cafe 101. What should I do? Well, what's my best response? 
Well, for probabilities less than two-thirds, wherever those two lines intersect, it's obviously this line is higher than that line. I, my payoffs, my expected payoffs are higher over here than they are over there. I should go to coffee culture if there's a low chance of them going to um, uh, Cafe 101. Okay. On the other hand, I should go to Cafe 101 if there's a high chance of going to Cafe 101. And what's low and high? Well, it's more or less than this point here, which is two-thirds. I got that idea. So I work out my best responses, and then I plunk them down in this diagram here. Remember, it's a red player. We're trying to say, what are the best responses of the red player to something the blue player does? Well, the blue player can do anything between 0 and 1, supposing they do low probabilities of going to coffee culture. Sorry, the Cafe 101. That's what Q is. Low probability of going to Cafe 101. Then if they're not likely to go to Cafe 101, they're likely to go to coffee culture, I should be going to coffee culture, which is a 0% chance on me going to Cafe 101. So all along here, these are the best responses of the red player to a blue player's choice of a low Q mix. On the other hand, if there's a Q is, is high, so in this region up here, that's high chances of them going to Cafe 101. I should be going to Cafe 101, put 100% chance on over here. And then that particular two-thirds line just in between, indifferent, okay? doesn't really matter what I do because I'm getting the same expected payoff over here. The graph that you have does exactly the same thing for the uh, the blue player. Should they go to Cafe 101? Should they go to Coffee Culture? Well, it depends what the other guy's going to do. I don't know what they're going to do. They could go to Cafe 101. They could go to Coffee Culture. Let's let P be the probability to go to Cafe 101. Plot it down here. Put in our two lines. Okay, now, if you have trouble, when, after the class, go back and try and figure, could I plot those two lines if I knew this payoff matrix? Okay, just give that a try. And uh, if you have difficulty with that, well, there, you know, uh, come and chat to me. Uh, uh, it's, uh, we can, it's probably easier face-to-face -face than that, or we can wait until you're um, preparing for your exam, but you should be able to do that. Okay? Just take these numbers, plot them, and add a graph, because then you can work out what the best responses are. Okay? Plot those best responses over in this graph, and we get a little funny different shape than we had before. Okay? What we get is, here's the line of red best responses going like this. Here's the line of blue best responses going to that, and they intersect at three points, A, B, and C, okay? Now, what's this point up here? This point, I mean, what happens is when you get these best response curves, remember we put our, our um, X's and O's, and we found that where two best responses were, uh, that, uh, sorry, let me say that again, in a payoff matrix, you know? We looked at, we put knots and crosses in there for the, um, for each of the players, and we're kind of looking at cells where there was both a knot and a cross. Well, that corresponds to an intersection of a line. And what's this, what's this Nash equal up, up here? Well, it's a, a red P of 1 and a blue P of 1, so it's 100% chance on CAFE 101, 100% chance on CAFE 101. That's that payoff cell right there. So th this Nash equilibrium A here corresponds to the one we figured out before in pure strategies. Okay? Pure strategies, mixed strategies? Yeah, well, a pure strategy is for sure I'm going there, okay? For sure you're going there. And that's, that picks up, this is the, in, in this diagram, that, this Nash equilibrium here at A corresponds to the Nash equilibrium we'd find with this cell here. And the Nash equilibrium at B, 0% chance of going to Cafe 101, 0% chance of going to Cafe 101. That means they're both going to coffee culture. That's this one down here, okay? And this one in the middle is playing these two mixtures, okay, the one-third chance I'm going to go to, uh, the um, as a blue player, uh, let me say that again, there's a one-third chance for the red player that they're going to go to, to uh, Cafe 101, there's a two-thirds chance for the blue player they're going to go to Cafe 101, so sometimes they're going to meet, sometimes they're not going to meet, and uh, there's, a, there's a, a payoff that comes out of that, and the payoff is the intersection, the height of that line there, it's sort of like, well, the, they're, you know, they're either going to meet or not going to meet, right? You know, one-third of the time, I'm the red player, I go to Cafe 101. Two-thirds of the time, you're the blue player, you go to Cafe 101. You know, sometimes we're going to miss, in which case we're going to get zeros, okay? When we hit, that's great, you know? If we're at Cafe 101, we get the payoffs up there. For coffee culture, we get the payoffs there. But if you're trying to think, you sort of step back and think, what are the payoffs I'm getting out of this game, on average, or in expectation? Uh, well, you know, 
somewhere between 0 and 1 and 2, depending which of these cells that you hit. Now, that's where there's a very interesting way of looking at these uh, coordination games and mixed strategies, which kind of steps back from the whole, you know, what strategies are you going to play? What are the mixed strategies? What are the pure strategies? And what it does is it looks at all the possible strategies, mixed or pure, and it plots the payoffs that you could get. Okay? So what I did here is here's the payoff to the red player, or utility of the red player. Here's the payoff to the blue player, utility the bl to the blue player. And what's this point A? Well, the point A is a payoff of 1 in red and 2 in blue. Let me shift that over a little bit so you can see that. Oops. Okay, a payoff of 1 to the red and 2 to the blue. 1 to the red and 2 to the blue. So that, belongs to that, that corresponds to that cell there. This one is a payoff of 2 to the red, 1 to the blue. So that's this cell over here. And, of course, we've got our zeros down here. They're tucked in this corner. Now, what I did is I drew these lines between all of the dots because when you're taking probability weighted averages of all these weights, and if you look at that little triangle, that little shaped triangle, that corresponds to all the expected payoffs that you could possibly have for any kind of mixed strategies you could think of. Okay? Like, for example, supposing, you know, on wet days, we kind of agree, you know, you look up in the sky, it's raining. I look up in the sky, it's raining. We're going to go to Cafe One when it's raining. And when it's sunny, we're going down to coffee culture, okay? Well, it sort of depends on the probability of rain or snow or rain or not rain, what's going to happen. But we'll either get over here or over there. We don't have to worry about the zeros. Well, that corresponds to kind of mixed strategies along this line over here. Now, there's a... Uh, Robert Allman, who got the Nobel Prize with Thomas Schelling in game theory, has a concept called correlated co equilibria, which is uh, this idea, well, people could coordinate together by some common sort of signal like that. And so they, they really, you know, we don't really know whether they're going to go one place or the other, but in some kind of larger game, which takes account of something, some other information signals they could use, they could coordinate their actions and they could get you know, they could either get at point A or they get at point B or in expectation somewhere along the line between A and B. Now, these expected payoffs for the mixed strategy equilibrium, I've actually calculated it and plotted in this little dot here. And you see they're kind of low. Okay? And mixed strategies often have that sort of problem is that, yeah, they work, but you miss out on a lot of payoffs here because, you know, I'm deciding what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it one-third of the time. You're deciding what you're going to do. You're going to do it two-thirds of the time. And a lot of the time, we're just not going to get together. So an average or an expectation, we're going to get low expected payoffs. Well, we'd kind of like to be able to get out here somehow. Okay? And so this little graph looks at all the payoff possibilities. It's quite a useful idea when we come to uh, Chapter 10 where we're trying to change games. And we're saying, look at you know, some of the payoff struck payoffs in these games are bad for both players. Couldn't we do something, either one of us, to try and improve the game for ourselves, okay, or for the other person, or for both of us? Okay, so the the idea is here. Well, yeah, there's lots of possibilities. We could get it A, we could get it B, we could get somewhere in between. If we do this mixed strategy stuff, it's kind of a bad equilibrium down here. Surely there's some way we can coordinate to get better payoffs. Okay, that's really all I want to say about the the battle of sexes game in chapter eight. They run through all of those two-by-two two coordination games, the chicken game, the battle of sexes game, the pure coordination game, you know, trying to kind of isolate, oh, yeah, there's mixed strategy equilibrium for all of those guys, too. Okay? I'm not going to ask you to, to mechanically crank out the details of those on an exam, but have a read through so you get this understanding, well, you know, okay, there's pure strategy equilibrium, and that's what, usually what we're looking for, but usually in games, as a matter of fact, always in games, there'll be some mixed strategy equilibrium. Okay, let me just take a little summary, which I didn't give you, to write down, and on mixed strategies. Okay, the first idea is that uh, in a two-by-two two game, uh, so we just think of mixed strategies in a simple two-by-two two game, where each player has two actions, then what we're thinking of is strategies now are, they've got to do with these probability distributions, okay? And there's two ways to interpret these probability distributions, and they're, they're kind of, it's not really one or the other, but it's both. In a, in a mixed strategy. One is that one of the players is randomizing. They're, they're not choosing a pure strategy. They've got some basis for themselves 
they eventually have to make a choice of a pure strategy, but they've got some basis which is creating unpredictability for the other player. Okay? So that's like a, you know, you sort of think of it, well, this is a choice of one player to make it unpredictable for the other player. So, you know, when the police are setting up their, their speed cameras, you know, they're going to they're gonna be sitting in their office and doing their coin tossing or whatever it is. You know, where are we going to put the, you know, the, uh, the speed cameras or the alcohol trucks tonight, you know, uh, uh, or the, the, the stops. Uh, the um, same way with the uh, Inland Revenue doing its auditing, you know, it wants to make it unpredictable, and it's got its own ways of doing that unpredictability stuff, you know. This year it's fountains that get it, you know, next year it's smiths, you know, maybe it's the color of their hair, maybe the, you know, it's the people who have, last year we did the people who had high income, now we're doing the people who have low income, you know, who knows. They have the, the idea is there's something, they, they want to make it unpredictable because they don't want to be too predictable because then they'll get, you know, well, not they'll get taken advantage of, but um, they won't get as good payoffs. So they, there may not be something, let me say that again, <laughs> in a game where there isn't a Nash equilibrium, we don't expect the pure strategies to predictability to emerge, and so there's an unpredictable element that we expect to happen. Uh, at the same time that this is a randomization of one player, it's also a belief of the other player. Now, the idea of the belief is, you know, when we're thinking of the lineup thing is when they're, you know, all X are going to throw long, they're going to throw short, they're going to do all kinds of other things. You know, the defending team... They, you know, they've got to figure, they, they're not sure what's going to happen either. They don't know exactly all the codes and stuff that, that and, and the things that are going on in the, in the minds of the captains and the players who are giving these signals and stuff. They can't figure that stuff out, but they have to come up with a belief about it. Okay? And in the mixed strategy sort of concept, that belief, the mixed strategy, the Q mix, the P mix that comes out in equilibrium is not only a randomized action of one of the players, but it's also a belief of the other player. And we call those, when those two things match up, they're correct beliefs. Okay? That's sort of the idea of Nash equilibrium. But it's, it's two-sided. It's sort of describing what to expect in a game. You expect unpredictability. That is, you don't know what's going to happen. But you can also expect a certain level of unpredictability. You can, you can characterize the person's uncertainty, their beliefs, about what's going to happen by a number. Okay? And that's a sharp number. It could be, you know, it's in our little examples, we can work through, we could say, well, you know, we, we expect uh, the point six and the point seven for each of the players to do this. Because if it's something different, then each of them would, and, and each of them knows it's something different, then they'd respond by a pure strategy and do something uh, better, and then the other player would respond, and it's, it would all break down. Okay, that, that set of expectations, mutually consistent, best responses, okay? So that's the idea of mixed strategy is, is I mean, it's, it's a very technical concept, but in one way it's kind of neat because it says you want to be able to work with the element of surprise. When do you want to work with that? Well, particularly when there's nothing predict predictable in a game, that is, there's no Nash pure strategy Nash equilibria, you might be able to find a, uh, a mixed strategy Nash equilibria where there really would be this element of surprise or unpredictability. Okay? So let's leave off uh, mixed strategies. It's a technical concept, but quite interesting. Okay, just keep it for the element of surprise. Oh, yeah. And the other thing to remember is, if you're trying to figure out what is a mixed strategy, use this idea that what one player's the equilibrium mixed strategies have this property that when I'm playing my mixed strategy, I'm making you indifferent. Okay. So the way to figure out the uh, what the equilibrium uh, mixed strategy is is to find out what is that unique one where those two lines cross. Okay, because that means that the for the expected payoff lines, because that means the other player will be indifferent. Now, let's go back to um, uh, a, a new topic. Switch to a new topic, and we're going to, for the first time, we're going to use in our strategic reasoning this uh, inverse probability stuff. Okay, now what I've done is I've kind of thought up a little example. Uh, which is in the uh, one side of the sheet that I've given out today, of um, a simple game. And th there's an intuition that's going to come out of this game uh, about the idea of private information. Now, in this game, both players are uncertain, kind of like the, you know, the line-out throw games uh, that we had that, um, uh, where there's no pure strategy equilibrium, these little coordination type or two-by-two -two games. This is different. It's a, it's a sequential kind of game. And eventually, we're going to draw a game tree for this. But at the beginning, don't worry about the game tree. Try to get the intuition behind this. Okay? And uh, 
the story goes something like this. There's going to be two players. So uh, blue player, um, you know, you're a venture capitalist. Venture capitalists have money. They're looking for interesting business ventures, and you have a uh, uh, there's an entrepreneur who comes up with a business venture. And I put this little example up because I have a friend who's now a multimillionaire who came to me uh, a few years back and talked um, about a biotech venture which he was trying to get money for. And um, this was a, a technology for, instead of having vaccinations with needles, um, it was a patch technology. And so what they do is they, they put a little patch on your skin and there's a, a chemicals in the... Well, um, not so much chemicals, biologically active molecules in the patch, which take the mole molecular stuff that the, the drugs are, brings it through your skin into your bloodstream. Okay, now this kind of, it's kind of a neat concept, and he was very excited about it because he had the U.S. Army as his client. Okay, and the U.S. Army, uh, you know, I mean, they do a lot of injections for their their, their people, uh, vaccinations. And, uh, and they've got this sort of captive clientele, and it's really expensive. You know, you're going to have needles that are disposable. You're going to have nurses. You're going to have offices. These people have to take time. It would be really nice if you just had a patch you could put on, you know, and then the guy would be protected from mustard gas or whatever else they're, they're doing. Another application that, that he was quite excited about was for use for animals because, uh, again, using um, veterinarians and needles – you know, there are always there are always these invasive sort of techniques where there's probably an infection and stuff like that. And nice little patch, you know, you put it on yourself. Don't need all this extra equipment. So this was quite exciting. Okay. So I, the idea is that we, we've, we've got a project that looks good, but there's a technology. Nobody really knows whether the technology would work or not. I mean, there, there's lots of these little scientific studies that people have done in this particular patch technology, and they're pretty common knowledge about what uh, these would do. So we want to think, we want to simplify this problem down and say either the technology is going to work. Or it's not going to work. Okay, two uh, two states. Okay, the technology is going to work or not going to work. So we use the symbols TW for that. Now the other thing is, even if the technology works, you don't know how much money you're going to make out of it. That's kind of another element of uncertainty. But let's just suppose we have nice numbers. Okay, like ten million if it works, zero million if it doesn't. For my friend, when they got bought out by this Irish company, we're talking like a couple hundred million if it worked, which it did, and. Uh, not big loss. Well, some losses if they did. I didn't buy into his company because I didn't have any money to do it, but I wish I had. Um, uh, he's a very wealthy guy now. So anyhow, let's just boil it down. And again, I'm, I'm using these simple numbers because we want to take probability weighted averages. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take probability weighted averages of 10 and 0. Okay. And those are, those are pretty good because anything times 10 is usually pretty easy to work out, and anything times 0 is even easier because it's always 0. Okay. So those, we're just, you know, just trying to keep it simple. But even that keeping it simple, we're going to have some great insights from this little example. Okay. Now, what the biotech entrepreneur uh, is suggesting two possible kind of risk-sharing arrangements. You know, they come basically... You know, people who are doing this kind of stuff usually don't have as much money as the venture capitalists, so they're, they're looking for somebody to pool some money in. And they come up with two options. A 50% share, which they, in this venture, remember it's going to be 10 million or zero, so they'll give you a 50% share of that, so 5 million or zero, for a million dollars. And needless to say, I didn't have a million dollars, and uh, you didn't, but you're a venture capitalist, though, so let's imagine that you do. Okay, so that's one of the options. The other is, how about a 90% share for half a million dollars? Which one looks better? Just off the cuff. 90%, well, I mean, if the first one looks good, 50% share for a million, why wouldn't I take 90% for a half a million? Okay. And that's the two questions that I want to ask is, how should you look at these proposals, and would you ever take one but not the other? Take number one but not number two. And the answer will be, well, yeah, it's quite possible for you not to take number one but not take number two. And that will depend on the fact that the entrepreneur has some private information about this new technology that you don't have. Okay? Now, you're both uncertain whether the technology is going to work, but they have some special private information. They maybe, you know, lots more experience in doing this stuff, lots of little tests that aren't public knowledge. And we're going to see that's going to make quite a difference as to how you evaluate these projects. Okay? So what we're going to, walk, we're going to do is walk through an example. It's a little numerical example, but it has this insight. Uh, well, we're going to use our probability-weighted average reasoning. 
we're going to use a little bit of ideas about risk aversion because you know when when uh, you know you're evaluating these projects, you might be a bit risk averse when you're looking at it from the perspective of the entrepreneur. You might think, well, she's risk averse. So let's have a look and see. Okay. So the first case is what I call the um, uh, the simple symmetric uncertainty case. Now, we what we have is the PDIP. Who are the players? Well, there's uh, you, the uh, venture capitalist, and there's the entrepreneur B. Okay, the, um, and what can they do? Well, in this case, it looks like uh, they're going to offer you for sale something or other at some different kind of contracts, and you've got to decide whether to accept or reject. Okay. Now, the, the next two things are <clears throat> the information and their payoffs, and I just want to emphasize this information thing because what we're going to do is look at two cases. Okay, one where you and the entrepreneur have the same information, and the other where she has private information. Okay, and we're just going to kind of walk through. Well, what are your payoffs with this kind of in these kinds of transactions? Now, first thing is information, right? Well, the information also means ignorance. Like, what are you uncertain about? Well, we're uncertain about whether the technology works or not. So let's put down a little truth table. Now, what do you mean by the truth table? Well, remember the truth table we did before for the diagnostic radiology thing and the breast cancer, for the taxi cabs and the witness report, you know, and you're doing for the Hinkley thing and the schizophrenia and uh, uh, and his culpability. So um, what do we have? The things we're uncertain about is whether the technology works, right? So it's one or zero. So uh, if it, it's true that they... The technology works. It's a one. If it's false, then it's a zero. And what are the? How do we think about the probabilities there? Well, let's just supposing that both the entrepreneur and the, and the venture capitalist believe that there's a 25 percent chance that this thing is work. I mean, you know, chances are it won't work, but pretty high. You know, 25 percent is not bad. Okay, just if you're thinking of coin toss, it's just like getting two heads in a row. That's not unreasonable. You know, it happens. Uh, it could get two tails in a row too. You know. Now, uh, the idea is it's one quarter, okay? And so we, 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 we take our little frequency table and we think, um, well, 25% chance on it being true or that it'll work and 75% chance that it won't. Now, I put those in blue, but I could put them in red, too, because the idea is both of you agree on this, right? You, you know as much about the technology working as or not as she does. Okay, at the beginning here. Okay, we'll see later on that she might know something you don't know. But in this case, that's a symmetric uncertainty. Both of you share the same knowledge about the uh, uncertainty. I mean, about the technology. Okay. Now, another way you can put this down is we know that the state that we're interested in is whether the technology works or not. And we'll write this little expression: the probability that the technology works is equal to 0.25, right? So we read this from left to right. Just It's not an equation or a formula. It's just a like an English language parsed out a little bit. Probability that the technology works is 0.25. The te probability that the technology doesn't work is 0.75. Now, so we, we've got our uncertainty. Remember PDIP. For the players, what can they do? What's their information? So here, the information is there's certain things they know, some probabilities of whether it work or not, and there's certain things they don't know, which is whether it's actually going to work or not. Uh, and then they, um, the probabilities or beliefs tell us what they believe they, these, about these uncertain things they don't know. And uh, they share those beliefs. And then what are their payoffs? Okay, well, what we've done so far is look at probability weighted averages. But just keep in mind a couple of things as we look at this is that, you know, a million bucks... Ten million bucks and zero is a lot of money. If you're going to buy a project for a million dollars, you know it's a risky project, a risky prospect. So we might be a little bit risk averse. We want to take that into account. So over here, what I did is I put down the payoffs. Um, under various kinds of arrangements. So the way to look at these is the top number ten and the bottom number is zero. I put them in black. I didn't put them in any particular color because I'm sort of thinking, well, the venture capitalists can think this way. The um, entrepreneur can think this way, which would be in red. The venture capitalist is in blue, but they're both got the same probabilities, same possibilities. So let's work it in black so it's the same for both. Okay. So what we think of is that if the technology works, you're either going to get 10 million 
Or if it doesn't work, you're going to get zero. So we're kind of looking down these two numbers. And if I take, if I take a 25% chance of it working, I'm, so probability 0.25 on 10 and probability 0.75 on zero, then the expected or the probability weighted average, the expected money value of this is 2.5. Okay, with me there? I, You've got, to be, you've got to be able to do those kind of calculations, but nothing more complicated, okay? It's 0.25 times this plus 0.75 times that, but that whatever we put down like this isn't going to matter because it's going to zero out. So it's, it's 2.5, okay? So that's the overall project. But what about this idea of the 50% share? Well, the 50% share is half of the 10 or 0. So we take half of 10, we take half of 0, and if you get a... So you had a 50% share in this project, you're either going to get... 5 or 0, okay? Now, what's the probability weighted average of 5? Well, at 0.25 times 5, that's 125. At 0.75 times 0, that's 0. So, oh, it's 1.25 million, okay? What about a 90% share of this? Well, 90% share is, you're going to get 9 if it works, and 0 if it doesn't work. So, again, we put 0.9 times 0.25, and... Uh, I hope my calculator in my head worked right to get that up to uh, 2.25 million. Okay. So these are these are your expect these are your expected payoffs. They're her expected payoffs. If you take probability weighted averages. Okay. Now, what happens if you have to pay a million dollars to this? You're the blue player. Okay. You're thinking. Okay, a 50% share, they're asking a million dollars to this. I, I, in blue, I put my net payoffs after I pay my million dollars. So I have to pay my million dollars, and if, if it works, I'm going to get five, so my net gain will be four. If it doesn't work, I'm out one because I'm not getting my million dollars back. Okay. So I take a probability weighted average of that, and it comes out to 0 0.25. Now, the other way you can sort of think about that is, basically, I'm expecting to get 1.25 million. I have to pay 1 million, so I subtract off one, what I have to pay from the 1.25. Now, it's, it's an easy calculation, right? You've got 1.25 minus 1. That should be 0.25 for most of us, if we remember our high school math. But the thing about this, the 1.25, is that you're either going to get, you know, 5 or 0. You know, you're either going to get 5 in net four, or you're going to get no payoff because it's not going to work and lose one. So this 1.25 isn't for sure. It isn't what you're actually going to get. It's what you expect to get. Whereas the one million you're subtracting off, that's money for sure. You're losing that, okay? But it comes out with a positive money value. Let's do the same thing for the 90% share. Now, for the 90% share, you're going to pay um, half a million dollars to this 90% share. That was part of the, that was the option number two. So you subtract off what you have to pay, uh, your half a million from the nine that you get if the technology works. But if it doesn't work, you only owe half a million dollars. Again, you can either take the probability weighted averages or you can recognize, well, you expect to get 2.25, you're going to pay 0.5, so you subtract that from the 0.5 from the 2.25 and you come up with 1.75. Now let me put this down over here. So your net expected gain from these two transactions is 0.25 or 1.75, right? That's just crunching it through, you know, taking the probability weighted averages and thinking, well, this is what I could expect to get if I take probability weighted averages. On the other hand, if you look at it this way, you know, if you look at the paying a million dollars or something with expectation 1.25, it's like, ooh, it's a, little, it's a little dicey, you know, it's a little bit close. And you might be thinking, I'm a little bit too risk averse to do that. I don't think I'd like to do that. Could be, right? Now, the idea when we're thinking about this is we don't know risk attitudes very well, but so we take the risk neutral guy as a benchmark for ourselves and for the other person, but then we want to think a little bit, uh, what if they're risk averse, okay? Um, if, if she's risk neutral, you know, she's not going to want to give up a, an option at five and zero. Uh, for an, with has an expected money value 1.25 for anything less than 1.25. But if she's risk averse, she might be willing to sell it to me for a bit cheaper, okay? Um, so we want to take that risk attitude into account a little bit. But here we're just, we're just taking our, 
you can, if you like, you can say, let's take our benchmark case, your risk neutral. You've got a positive expected gain on, on pay, for a 50% share at 1 million. You've got a positive expected gain, a higher positive expected gain for a 90% share at 0.5 million. And that's the kind of intuitive logic we have. You'd say, well, given either of these two options, as long as I'm not too risk averse, I would buy them, right? I would take them. And you could, would she sell them? Well, let's suppose that she's pretty risk averse, okay? So she's uh, uh, not pretty risk averse, but risk averse enough. So she's, she's willing to sell um, this option at five and zero with an expected value of one point, money value of 1.25 to you for, for one, okay? A little bit less than what its expected value is. And ditto for this one here. The, uh, this one is kind of a, uh, quite a large discrepancy between the 2.25 expected value and the 90% share. And she's giving up this, okay? She's giving up nine or zero. And all she's getting back is 0.5 million. But she's, you know, let's suppose that she's willing to do that, okay? So that we want to ask, we want to put ourselves in the, in the shoes of the other, the other player and ask, are they willing to do that or not? But in this case, if she's willing to, to sell it at the 90% share, you'd, be, you'd want to grab it. And you'd certainly want to grab it if, you, uh, if she's selling it at a 50% share. But that's with no private information. Um, let's have a look at the case where she has private information. Now, what's the nature of the private information? What you think of it, again, we're going to go back to our little diagnostic signals, okay? The, um, the entrepreneur, the biologist, you know, the, they've been working with this stuff for a long time. They're doing all kinds of tests. A little bit shows up in the public arena, but they kind of know test results which other people don't know. The venture capitalists don't know. But the venture capitalists know that they don't know, okay? So they're, they're trying to think, well, what's the uncertainties here? PDIP. Okay, we've got players, what they can do, but it's their information now that's going to change. And what we realize is the uncertainties are, the truth table we want to look at is something like this. It's true that te technology works. Yes, yes, no, no. But there's a test, a signal, okay? And the signal will be positive or it'll be negative, okay? So if the signal's positive, yes, no, yes, no, these four columns give us all the logical probabilities. Now, what we want to do is we want to sort of think, we want to think of, um, we want to think of probabilities, and, and these are, remember, I've made these numbers up. They don't, they're not coming out of nowhere, but they're coming out for a certain reason, because they make the inverse probability calculations a little bit easier, but it works something like this. What we're trying to think of is there's a 25% chance that we're going to get a, the thing's going to work. There's a 75% chance that it's not going to work, so we're over here in the zeros. So we think our natural frequency is adding up to 100. We think, well, there's 75, you know, balls in the air in here. There's 25 balls in the air in there that are, you know, where the technology is going to work and where it's not going to work. But we also have to worry about whether the test results are going to be positive or not, okay? Now, notice in this little side over here, out of the 25, if the technology works, it will always show up with a positive test result. Okay. There are no, there are none of these false negatives, okay, where you get a negative test, but the technology really is good. So the person who does the test, if it turns out positive, okay, they're going to know that this technology is, um, uh, no, let me say that again. <laughs> Got a, I did the wrong program around. If the technology works, and you knew that technology worked, then you always, you know that the test result is going to come up positive. And that would be a very, very sensitive test. Okay? We use the sensitivity and specificity for the diagnostic things. Same idea here. But let's look at what happens over here where when the technology isn't going to work, that's 75 out of the 100 cases, 25 of those come up with these false positives, 50 come up saying, you know, it's a negative test result. Okay? So the test isn't very perfect. Or, uh, well, we say it's not very specific in the sense that if the technology works, it'll capture that. But if the technology doesn't work, it captures that most of the time, two-thirds of the time. Okay? But uh, one-third of the time, it's going to miss that out, 25 out of the 75. Okay? So th remember, that's how we looked at our logic of, the, of, of uncertainty. Let me just, let me just run through uh, one, one thing so I get the inverse probabilities. We won't go beyond that. We want to calculate the 
probabilities of the thing working or not, given that they've got the signal. Not the probabilities that the test is going to give us a positive result, given the technology works, or the test is going to give us a negative result, given the technology doesn't work. Okay. We're not interested, well, we are interested in those probabilities. Venture capitalist shares those, that knowledge. The entrepreneur shares that knowledge. Uh, they understand the testing technology. But let's look at the inverse probability. Suppose you know the test result is positive. Okay, plus, plus. There's 50 of those counts there, so half and half. Now it's 50-50 that technologies work if you get a positive test result. If you get a negative test result, you know for sure that technology is not going to work. Okay, because there's nothing in that cell there. Okay, so you get a negative test result, then all 50 of those are going to be associated with the technology not working. So here we have the inverse probabilities that we would work with if we saw the test result are very different than the initial probabilities of 0.25. Okay, now the thing is, you're the venture capitalist. You know, probably is the technology working or not. You know all about the diagnostic technology, but you don't know what test results she got because she hasn't published that. Okay. Now, what we want to do, what we'll do in the next class, we'll walk through this idea, how much difference does that private information make? And it turns out to be absolutely fundamental. Okay. Because what's going to happen is, what do you see as a venture capitalist? You see her offering you a 90% chance for half a million dollars. So she's going to offer, make an offer for sale. What you're going to conclude out of that is, she must have had a negative test result. Okay. And if she got a negative test result, I know this thing is absolutely worthless. Okay. You don't see what the negative test result is, but you infer it from her behavior towards you. And that's just like the TAB sports betting guys who, who close down their books. When they, when they see bets from these big bettors, they've got their little hit list of 36 people. These people make a bet. They don't take it, and they, move, they try and figure out where are odds out of here. These guys have private information, and we're going to lose money. Okay? So again, we'll just keep walking through this example at the beginning of the next class, and then we'll be talking about adverse selection and the lemons principle. Then a little bit about signaling, screening, warranties,